When ancient men gathered around their campfires at night, what do you think they imagined about the bright light above them in the darkness? What was it? A sign? A warning? Was it a god? We can only imagine all the explanations they came up with for it being there, let alone, reasons for its constant changes from a perfect bright sphere, to melting away and growing back to fullness again. of the forest are in awe? When we humans today look upon it beaming brightly in the magnificent desolation, it gives us that same sense of wonder. But, what is the moon? Has it always been Earth's companion? How did it come to be? Chaotic worlds, in a crowded neighborhood. Early Earth was a hot turbulent world. Bombarded regularly from debris from the sky. There. Coupled with the tug from Earth and Venus, gravity took hold. Thea was mostly vaporized, but did mix in some of its matter with the swirling debris. Earth was badly damaged, but survived.
It's the brightest and most noticeable object in the night sky. But if you spend much time observing it, you will see that the moon is never quite the same from one night to the next. The moon has something we call phases, which means that it appears to change shape a little bit every night. To understand why this happens, we need to talk a little bit about the way the Earth and the Moon move together in space. The Moon orbits around the Earth, much like the Earth orbits around the Sun. However, while the Earth takes about 365 days to travel once around the Sun, one year, the Moon completes its orbit around the Earth in only 29 and a half days, or about one month. That's actually where the idea of months came from, the time it takes for the moon to complete one orbit around the Earth. And the words moon and month come from the same root. Despite how bright it looks in the sky, the moon does not have any light of its own. It only appears to shine brightly in the sky because light from the sun hits it and bounces off. Just like the Earth, the moon has a day side and a night side with half of it in sunlight and half of it in darkness at any one time. As the moon travels through its orbit around the Earth, that dividing line between day and night, called the Terminator, is visible from different angles, giving the impression that different amounts of the moon are lit up on different days. The cycle of lunar phases begins with the new moon. At new moon, the moon appears completely dark because the unlit side is facing the Earth. New moon is the only time in the lunar cycle when a solar eclipse could happen because it is the only time that the moon is between the sun and the Earth. After a few days, once the moon has moved along a little in its orbit, we can begin to see some of the moon's day side from Earth. What we see is just a thin slice of light called a crescent. We call it a waxing crescent because waxing means growing. The crescent moon will grow a little bit thicker every night until it reaches the next phase, first quarter. The first quarter moon is sometimes called the half moon because it appears to us that half of the moon is illuminated but it is called first quarter because the moon is one quarter of the way through its cycle. As the days pass, the moon continues to grow, soon entering its next phase, the waxing gibbous. Gibbous means humped or swollen, and again, we call it waxing because it grows thicker every night until it reaches the next phase, the full moon. A full moon is the biggest, brightest, and easiest phase of the moon to see. The moon rises at sunset and is up all night, so if you are outside and the sky is clear, it's hard to miss. The moon is halfway through its orbit around the Earth and is now on the opposite side of the Earth from the Sun. During a full moon is the only time that a lunar eclipse can happen because that is the only time that the Earth's shadow could fall on the moon. As the moon continues in its path, it appears to shrink again as we begin to see more and more of its dark side. A few days after the full moon, the moon will be a gibbous again, but this time it's a waning gibbous. Waning means shrinking or getting smaller, and so the moon will be waning for the rest of its orbit. The next phase is another half moon, but this time it's called third quarter, or sometimes last or final quarter, because the moon is three quarters of the way through its orbit. Soon the half moon shrinks into a waning crescent, which will continue to shrink night after night until it vanishes completely into the next new moon. Big and bright and beautiful, different every night, but repeating the same cycle over and over. The moon is one of the best objects in the sky to observe, especially for someone just getting started. The next time you look up and see the moon in the sky, 
Take a moment and see if you can identify which phase of the moon you're seeing and try to figure out which one will come next. How does the moon affect the tides? You have probably witnessed high and low tides at the beach, but what causes this? Tides are caused by the interaction of Earth, the moon, and the sun. Gravity is the cause. The force of gravity exerted by an object pulls other objects toward it. In the case of the moon, its gravity makes the ocean on Earth bulge toward it, causing a high tide. A low tide results where the pull is weakest. If we had no moon, you can see that the water around the earth would be distributed evenly. But with a moon, the gravity does its work. The pull of the sun affects the tides just like the moon. When the moon and sun are lined up together, the result is an extremely high tide, and extremely low tide. This happens about every two weeks. What was happening to the moon? The Incas believed a giant celestial jaguar was attacking the moon and making it bleed. Hindu stories said that a demon called Rahu chased the moon and sun around the sky, occasionally swallowing them. Many other cultures had reasons for what we now call an eclipse. Fear and rituals were dominant with the ancients during these times of uncertainty. A total lunar eclipse takes place when the Earth comes between the Sun and the Moon and its shadow covers the Moon. Eclipse watchers can see the Moon turn red when the eclipse reaches totality. Total eclipses of the Moon happen at full Moon when the Sun, Earth, and Moon are aligned to form a line. The astronomical term for this type of alignment is syzygy, which comes from the Greek word for being paired together. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. After the successful launch by the Soviet Union of the Sputnik satellite in October of 1957, the U.S. President John F. Kennedy realized that Russia was leading America in space technology. The space race had begun. Russia would go on to beat the U.S. by putting Yuri Gagarin into orbit on April 12, 1961. Kennedy then made his vow to Congress that year of putting a man on the moon before the end of the decade and returning him home safely to Earth. Seven men were chosen to become the first astronauts, and were to be part of the Mercury program. The seven Mercury astronauts were, Malcolm Scott Carpenter, L. Gordon Cooper, John H. Glenn Jr., Virgil I. Gus Grissom, Walter M. Shura Jr., Alan B. Shepard Jr., and Donald K. Deke Slayton. The Mercury program achieved success on May 5, 1961 when Alan Shepard made the first suborbital flight in a spacecraft called Freedom 7. This made Shepard the first American to reach space. On February 20, 1962, John Glenn made a complete orbit of the Earth in space aboard his Friendship 7 space capsule, splashing down safely in the ocean. 
The Mercury program wound down in May of 1963 with the astronauts now capable of taking on space flight. Project Gemini was NASA's second human space flight program, started in 1961 and concluding in 1966. The Gemini spacecraft carried a two-astronaut crew. Ten Gemini crews and 16 individual astronauts flew low-Earth orbit missions during 1965 and 1966. Gemini's objective was the development of space travel techniques to support the Apollo mission to land astronauts on the Moon. In doing so, it allowed the United States to catch up and overcome the lead in human space flight capability the Soviet Union had obtained in the early years of the space race, by demonstrating, mission endurance up to just under 14 days, longer than the 8 days required for a round trip to the moon, methods of performing extravehicular activity without tiring, and the orbital maneuvers necessary to achieve rendezvous and docking with another spacecraft. During the Gemini project, a tragedy occurred in Dallas, Texas on November 22, 1963 with the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. It was feared that the space program would suffer, but new President Lyndon B. Johnson vowed to achieve Kennedy's goal. All Gemini flights were launched from Launch Complex 19 at Cape Kennedy Air Force Station in Florida, which had been renamed from Cape Canaveral to honor the slain president. Their launch vehicle was the Gemini, Titan II, a modified intercontinental ballistic missile. Gemini was the first program to use the newly built Mission Control Center at the Houston Manned Spacecraft Center for Flight Control. The astronaut corps that supported Project Gemini included the Mercury 7, the New 9, and the 1963 astronaut class. During the program, three astronauts died in air crashes during training, including both members of the prime crew for Gemini 9. This mission was flown by the backup crew. The Apollo missions would be the final stage to putting man on the moon. It would require courage and dedication as man left the comforts of Earth's orbit and traveled into space. The rocket that launched the astronauts would be the giant Saturn V, a machine unlike anything ever built, standing at 364 feet tall. The space capsule would accommodate three astronauts. Attached to the capsule, or command module, would be a lunar module or LEM, that was capable of detaching from the spacecraft, flying on its own, landing on the moon, launching back into space and docking with the command module. Apollo 1. Designed to be the first manned mission of the Apollo program, it was instead marked by tragedy, as an electrical fire in the command module during a pre-flight test killed all three crew members, Virgil Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. An extensive investigation revealed that an exposed wire had sparked in the highly flammable oxygenized cabin. Apollo 2 and 4 were jointly renamed and combined with previous Gemini flights, and Apollo 3 and 5 were launched unmanned. Manned flights resumed with Apollo 6 through 10, in preparation to meet the following objectives. Apollo 7, traveling into deep space, spacecraft control, conducting live TV broadcasts. Apollo 8, reaching the moon and circling it, Apollo 9, performing flight tests, testing the lunar module by docking and undocking, and performing spacewalks, Apollo 10, full dress rehearsal with Lem coming to within 8 miles of the moon's surface. And now the die was cast. It was time to attempt to fulfill J.F. Kennedy's vow to put a man on the moon. On July 16, 1969, which would occur before the goal of the end of the decade, the spacecraft Apollo 11 prepared to launch a crew of three astronauts into space, and the history books. NASA officials selected Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins as the astronauts who would make the historic trip from Earth on Apollo 11. Apollo 11, 30 seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. 
T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence starts. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Lift up on Apollo 11. Oh, boy. Oh, boy, it looks good, Wally. Somebody must be leaving the arm. Building shaking. We're getting that buffeting we've become used to. What a moment. Man on the way to the moon. So far, doesn't it, Wally? Very good, very good. That's that's. Beautiful. The Saturn V rocket that lifted the Apollo 11 spacecraft out of Earth's orbit had been reduced to its final stage, the S-4B. The Command and Service Module, or CSM, separated from the S-4B turned through 180 degrees and docked with the lunar module, or LEM. The now combined CSM and LEM pulled away from the S-4B rocket, proceeding on its roughly 250,000 mile journey to the moon during the translunar coast phase. Almost three days later, the spacecraft entered lunar orbit. The crew spent the next 25 hours performing various systems, checks and tests while in orbit around the moon. Before touching down, the three men split up. Collins boarded Apollo 11's command module, the Columbia, where he would remain in orbit around the moon. Armstrong and Aldrin boarded Apollo 11's lunar module, the Eagle, and began to descend to the moon's surface. Okay, Charlie, we're at the lab. The uh, docking index mark is the same. Roger, we copy. Houston, Apollo 11. Uh, Apollo 11. The Lunar Module Eagle was again given a thorough checkout to ensure the functioning of all systems, as Armstrong and Aldrin prepared to seal themselves off from Collins in the command module and for the two craft to pull apart. Okay, let's go there, Capcom on the hot fire. Okay, all flight controllers going around the horn. Go, no, go for undocking. Okay, retro. Go. Fido. Go. Guide. Go. Control. Go. Telcom. Go. Jinsey. Go. Ecom. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom, we're go for undocking. Hello, Eagle Houston. We're standing by. Over. The Eagle has wings. 
on its own now, but with Columbia near at hand, it coasted around to the backside of the moon, and there, while out of direct communication with the Earth, it fired its engine to slow its descent to a touchdown on the near side of the moon. Collins in Columbia continued in orbit, awaiting their return. Flight controllers, go no go for landing. Retro. Go. Fido. Go. Guidance. Go. Control. Go. Telcom. Go. GNC. Go. Ecom. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Altitude 4200. Houston, you're a go for landing. Over. Roger, understand. Go for landing. 3,000 feet. You're looking great. How you doing, Control? We look good here. Fine. Roger, how about you, Telcom? Go. Guidance, you happy? Go. Fido. Go. 2,000 feet. 2,000 feet. Into the ag. 47 degrees. Roger. 37 degrees. Still looking very good. Here go. Top alarm. 1201. 1201. Roger, 1201 alarm. 1201 alarm. Same type, we're go, flight. Okay, we're go. We're go. Same type, we're go. Altitude 1600. Eagle looking great. Roger, 1202, we copy it. 35 degrees. 750. Coming down to 23. 540 feet down at 15. 150 feet down at 4. Altitude velocity light. Three and a half down. 220 feet. Five and forward coming down nicely. 200 feet. Four and a half down. Five and a half down. 100 feet. Three and a half down. Nine forward. 875 feet. That's looking good. Down a half. Six forward. 60 seconds. Lights on, forward, forward, 40 feet down, two and a half, picking up some dust, straight shadow, four forward, drift into the right a little, 30 seconds, forward, just, contact light, okay, engine stop, we copy it down, Eagle, Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed, Roger Twain. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Uh, be advised, there uh, are lots of smiling faces in this room and all over the world. Over. Uh, there are two of them up here. Roger, it was a beautiful job, you guys. And don't forget one in the command module. Roger. The Eagle made a risky landing in a shallow moon crater named the Sea of Tranquility. Most people watching the landing on TV didn't know that the Eagle had only 20 seconds of landing fuel left at this point. Armstrong and Aldrin looked out the windows of the module at the lifeless and barren lunar landscape. After six and a half hours pass, the pair inside the Eagle prepared to exit the module. Neil Armstrong, being the commander would be first, cementing his place in history. Fine-grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. Ground mass uh, is very fine. I'm going to step off the limb. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. Oh, that looks beautiful for me, Neil. It has a stark beauty all its own. It's... 20 minutes later, Aldrin climbed down the ladder and joined his partner. There you got it. That's a good step. Yep. Got a three footer. Beautiful view. Isn't that something? Magnificent flight out here. Magnificent desolation. Then the first man on the moon read a plaque attached to a leg of the eagle. Underneath it says, Dear men from the planet Earth, first set foot upon the moon, July 1969, it is. It came in peace for all mankind. The two planted the United States flag on the surface. President Richard Nixon called to congratulate the astronauts. Armstrong and Aldrin went back to work collecting samples of moon rocks and dust. Two and a half hours later, 
at 17 hours and 54 minutes UTC, they lifted off in Eagle's ascent stage to rejoin Collins aboard Columbia in lunar orbit. Okay, I'm gonna get the pro. 99, proceeded. Three, two, one. Ignition. Right away, Houston. That's your grid. Excellent. Good over. Back here, you have good thrust. Okay, 30 seconds. 308, your number. Take coming through 1,500 feet. And H dot looks good. Eagle Houston, uh, trim residuals. Showing a par paraloon of 9.1 nautical miles, apaloon 47.2 nautical miles on the pings. All three systems are go. Cutoff velocity showing about 55, 37 feet per second, uh, plus or minus a foot or so on, the, on each of the three systems. There you go, Houston, tram looks good. Houston. Showing a par paraloon of 9.1 nautical miles, apaloon 47.2 nautical miles on the pings. All three systems are go. Over. 
Apollo 11, this is Houston. Radio check, over. All right, Roger. We're copying you about uh, five by two. Very weak. Can you give us a status report, please? Uh, understand you are using the high gain over. With a successful docking, Michael Collins welcomed Armstrong and Aldrin back into the command module so they could prepare for the journey back to Earth. Columbia fired out of lunar orbit to begin its three-day fall back to Earth, where the recovery fleet was waiting for its splashdown in the Pacific. Apollo 11, Houston, uh, with a little uh, recovery force information, over. Go ahead. Hi, uh, Roger, the uh, Hornet is uh, on the station, uh, just far enough off the target point to uh, keep from getting hit. Recovery 1, the uh, chopper... July 24th, the Hornet was on station, and the President of the United States was aboard. Re-entry into the Earth's invisible atmosphere carries with it one of the most critical moments. Traveling nearly 25,000 miles per hour, the command module can miss the angle of re-entry by only several degrees and disintegrate into flames or bounce off into space, never to return. Velocity 33,000 feet per second. 35,000 feet per second now. 36,000 feet per second. We're at entry time. There's blackout. The Apollo 11 crew returned to Earth on July 24, 1969. The recovery was quick and the astronauts were brought aboard the Hornet and quickly escorted into an isolation chamber to begin a three-week quarantine. They were then greeted by President Nixon and soon, their wives. The former late President John F. Kennedy's goal had been fulfilled, and within the time frame. Over the next several years, 10 astronauts would follow in Armstrong and Aldrin's footsteps.
leading to a wealth of scientific discoveries. The last mission to the moon was in 1972. It has been well over 50 years since humans last went to the moon, however. Humans are planning on returning to the moon as early as 2024. NASA's Artemis program is scheduled to begin testing in 2022 with hopes of sending a woman to the moon by 2024. In the private sector, SpaceX's Elon Musk continues to ready his Starship for flights to the moon and even Mars. These are currently the only two American rockets at this time capable of deep space flight. Both programs, however have been plagued by delays. We will soon see if we make it back to the moon. <laughs> 